Mukuti chwani. We tume the sounds of grace. Sikina zenu nati. I could even hear my name mentioned in that song. Mutakufa. <laughs> God bless you. Good morning, saints. Happy Sabbath. Welcome you to our uh, seminar under the health department with a health message under the theme um, the theme says God's solution to disease that is through natural remedies God's solution to disease through natural remedies some of you may have been following us last night online some of them came here so without wasting much time I invite you to come with me to Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. That's our theme text for the three days from last night, today, and tomorrow. Please don't miss this afternoon. We are going to have a Bible study. It's cardinal that you attend. And tomorrow, we're going to have a health expo where we'll show the mundane, common things that you may have even in your backyard, but that God uses to heal diseases. So, Revelation 22, verse 2, the Bible says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. May the Lord now add a blessing to the reading of his word. The message for this morning decided to entitle it, Give the glory to him. Give the glory to him, shall we pray. This is your time now, Lord God, that your name be lifted higher as we diminish into nothing. When all will be said, let glory and honor be ascribed to you. In Jesus' name we ask and pray, amen. amen. Give the glory to him. Beloved, did you know that the health message is the wedge that propels the everlasting gospel. And for every generation that has existed on this planet Earth, there has been a message that has been relevant to that generation. But cumulatively put together, all these messages are known as the everlasting gospel. Do you know that in the health message we find the state of the dead? In the health message we find the immutability of the law of God. In the health message... We find the grace of God. We find the sanctuary message in the health message. And the three, the, the, the message for this last generation living on earth before Jesus Christ comes again is known as the three angels' messages. Those are found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through verse 11. Those that adhere to the first angel's message, which is recorded in verse 6 and verse 7, are the ones that Jesus will come and translate to heaven. We are divided into two camps. And the earth has been divided into two camps since the entrance of sin. Others are represented by Abel, the first martyr, and the others are represented by uh, Cain. All of us may purport to be worshipping God, but what makes the demarcation is the how, how we worship God and who we obey. So Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, the first angel's message, says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. In that message, we have got three imperatives, and an imperative is not a suggestion. An imperative is a command. When God speaks, he means what he says. God does not speak in order to hear his voice. God does not only talk the talk. It's human beings who talk the talk, and talk is cheap. God walks the talk. God means what he says and says what he means. So the first angel's message has got three imperatives. The first imperative is fear God. And we know that to fear God is to obey God. Like it says in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and understanding. And also it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 
verse 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of mankind. For God shall bring everything into judgment, including the secret things, things done in the secret, whether they be good or whether they be evil. But the second imperative, that's where we are zeroing in today, says, give glory to him. And then it will give a reason why fear God and give glory. It says, for the hour of his judgment is come. Is. It's not a, a grammatical error. Is because that process is in process right now. Uh, there is a judgment taking place in heaven we know as the investigative judgment. But it says, give glory to him. What is to give glory to God? Paul writes in a second, Paul writes in, in a first Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verse, uh, first Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. And he says this. And if, I want to make Paul's words my words this morning. He says, for though I preach the good news, the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the good news or the gospel. I preach the gospel. I come here when the bidding was translated to me that I should come and preach. I had no option but to come. Why? Because necessity has been laid upon me. Because God does not need me. God can raise up stones to preach in my place. And through the preaching of the gospel, also I'll get the grace of God, I'll be saved. But there's nothing in me to glory, nothing in you to glory. And yet the imperative still comes, give glory to God. So where do we get that glory from? Where do we get this glory from? But like our theme text that we read, the Bible reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, whether you drink or eat or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. What that means is that our thoughts, the things that we do, we should always pause for a minute and ask a question. Does this glorify God? Does this bring honor to God? Does this please God? That must be our first task, always to please God, not to please human beings. What also does it mean to give glory to God? He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, And we all, with open face, beholding as if it were in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. That is what we call sanctification. When we first accept Jesus as our personal savior, it's known as justification. At that point, all our past sins are forgiven and we stand before God just as if we have never sinned. But God does not leave us stranded, not knowing what to do. The people who propagate the message that once saved, always saved, it's a lie. Sanctification is the process that we go through up to the time we are called to sleep in the cold dust of the earth or up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Only then, when Jesus finds us still holding on to him faithfully and praying the prayer of Jacob that I'm not let go of you until you bless me, then only will Jesus pronounce, well done, good and faithful servant. As of now, we are not good. So sanctification, according to Sister White, in the, bo in, 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 in the book, councils on Stuart, page 585. Sanctification is not a work of a minute or an hour, of a week, but of a lifetime, one day at a time. The future, if we don't worry about tomorrow or yesterday. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow, it is a mystery. But what belongs to you and to me is today. How we live life. Like they say in Tonga, Hiba. What you ate this morning, what is in your belly, what is in my belly, that's what belongs to us. That which you have left at home and saying we are going to eat tomorrow or the other day or evening, it may be used to host our own funerals. Same with the, with the, with the relationship with Jesus Christ. It's one day at a time. And as we go there, then when Jesus comes, then we shall enter into his glory. What does it mean? Through sanctification, through the working of the Holy Spirit, our characters are being transformed on daily basis to, uh, to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. And when God looks at us, he does not see our sinful selves. He sees the image of his son. Someone said those that do mining, and we see it now, it is a, a really flourishing all over. People are mining gold, they're mining whatever, they're digging, using whatever instruments. Those that do mining on a, 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 on a small scale, when you have mined the ore, 
You may not tell the difference between ordinary soil and the ore, whether it contains gold or copper. So what they do in the process of processing or refining, you put in a crucible, a vessel that can resist intense heat, and you subject it to intense heat, but the, the proceeds that are inside the crucible, the ore, will begin to melt. And the one who is processing, who is refining, will keep on scooping the dross and throwing away, scooping the dross and throwing away. Someone asked the question, how do you know now that the mineral is refined, that is pure? He said, by looking into the pot and you can see the image, the reflection of your face on top of the metal, then you know it is fine. And that's why it says by uh, beholding the face of Jesus Christ on daily basis by having a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are changing the same image from glory to glory by the work of the Holy Spirit so that when God looks at us, he sees the image of his son. That's how we give glory to God. It's a lifestyle. It is not the declaration of Zambia as a Christian nation. Much as it may sound good to our ears, it has not produced a single Christian. Christianity is not an event, but rather a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is based on individual relationship, my individual relationship with Jesus Christ. Nobody can come in between, not my pastor, not my wife, not my children, not my grandchildren. Nobody. If I die and I be lost, the blame will be put on him. It will be me to choose. God has created us as free moral agents with the freedom of choice. The young preacher who preached the sermon it, he said that uh, we bear the consequences of our own choices. And he says so in Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap also. You cannot eat junk food and expect to have good health. When you go sick, you start saying, why me God? It's not God was eating, it's you who made the decision. With your hard-earned money, you decide to eat junk food and you end up being sick and you end up blaming God. No, sir. God has given us the freedom of choice to choose whether to go to hell or to go to heaven. And God has created us free moral agents with the freedom to say to God, I don't want you. I could stop preaching right now and walk out of here. No one of you will stop me. Nobody, not even the police can stop me because that's freedom of choice. So the health message is embedded in the three angels' messages and it's the wage for taking the gospel to the world. We have not utilized this very open chance as the remnant church. At my church, I've spoken to my pastor. And even if I don't see things moving, I'm going to go to the conference. I've said, I've suggested to the pastor that let us have the health department incorporated in the personal ministries. As we do the preaching, the health department must be in front. Even every Sabbath as people are coming to worship, we are not yet discouraged. Maybe even Bible study, we should have the healthy people say, we're standing outside there checking our blood pressure and our diabetes. Believe you me, if we checked everyone over here, we'd be shocked to find maybe even 10% of us here are diabetic and hypertensive. It has become a scourge. It is a pandemic. But when we take the health message, it has got no divisions. It does not suffer from prejudice. Because whether people belong to whatever denomination, when they are sick, they are sick. Jesus Christ said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, For what shall it benefit a man to own the whole world but lose his own soul? When one is sick, it will go across denomination. It grows across the ethnic groupings. Because when you are sick, then you become miserable. And we do find that right in the book of Genesis, we find the health message. What am I talking about? Just in Genesis chapter 1, when God finished creating everything and declared it, it was very good. He declared very good in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. But in verse 29, he gave the diet upon which man should subsist. Then in verse 30, the diet that all these other creatures must subsist on. So in verse 29, he gave a diet comprising of fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds. And in verse 30, he gave the diet for the other creatures comprising of the same, but he added green herb. And we know that a man then was given also to eat green herb in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18, after the entrance of sin. But right there in the Garden of Eden, through disobeying God by eating what God said don't eat, that's how sin came in. And that's why when Jesus started the ministry after his baptism, he was taken to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil. And the temptation, just like the devil was successful with our first parents, Adam and Eve, over food, he had to bring temptation to Jesus Christ over food. He 
He said, if you are the son of man, turn these stones into loaves of bread. Then you can eat. Jesus replied in Matthew 4, verse 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word means every word. From Genesis chapter 1 to verse 1 to Revelation 22, verse 21, every word was put there for a purpose. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, if you remove certain words and say, in the beginning created heaven and earth, you have removed God, it becomes meaningless. Or you say, created heaven and earth, you remove it in the beginning, it becomes void, null and void. But every word that is put here is for our benefit and we must live by it. We must go by what God says. Our theme says that uh, God's solution to disease and natural through natural remedies. God is the creator. He's the one who prescribed that we must subsist on a plant-based diet. All the diet that he gave, it was not cooked. It came from the plants. Plants have got the, the ability to extract all the minerals that compose of the human body, which come from the dust. Because Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, God formed man of the dust of the earth. But we do find there the message of the state of the dead. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 16, God came to Adam and said, because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree that I said you should not eat of, curse is the ground for your sake. Thorns and thistles shall it produce. And from the sweat of your face you shall eat food until you return to the dust. Because out of the dust you are taken to the dust you shall return. But it's amazing when you see the high profile funerals being beamed on the television and you hear people of the cloth standing in front and saying, oh, he has gone to be in glory with God, and they are singing with the angels. And you wonder where is that coming from? The creator said when you die, you go back to the dust. He never said you're going to go to heaven. And it is through the health message that has been given to the remnant church. It's through the health message that the wage of propelling the gospel message has been able to go to the world, some unentered areas like the 1040 window in the Middle East and the Far East and the Western um, um, side of Africa through the health message because health knows no limitations and god says in first corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 don't you know that your body is the temple of god where the holy spirit dwells if any man that's a warning any man defile the temple of god which temple you are such a man will god destroy that's a, a very solemn warning that is coming from god almost equivalent to the warning that we find in the third angel's message. The second angel's message in Revelation 14 verse 8 says, and another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she has made all the inhabitants of the earth drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel's message, verse 9 through verse 11 says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast, and his image, and receive his mark in the hand and on his forehead. They shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God poured out into his cup of indignation without any mixture, and shall be tormented with the fire and brimstone in the presence of the, his angels and of the Lamb. And they have no rest day and night, those that worship the beast and receive his mark in the hand and the, his name on the forehead. That's a great warning. Those that have not adhered to the first angel's message and they, they watch the beast, mind you, we are divided according to who we worship or how we worship. The Bible says there are people that hate God and there are people that love God. That's what makes the division of the two camps. What does it mean to hate God? We even find there the health message. To hate God is to not to obey God. And to glorify God is to obey him. Moses came and said to God, may I see, show me your glory. God said, you cannot see my glory and live. But nonetheless, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. And I'm going to pass by. You only see my back parts. And then God passed by. In Genesis chapter 34, verse 6. It is God who spoke those words, not Moses. He said, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious showing mercy to the thousands of those that love him and obey him, but will not let go one sin go unpunished. What God did 
was to show how he had dealt with Moses individually and with the cantankerous stiff-necked children of Israel throughout their sojourn in the, in the wilderness. And then Moses saw that God is gracious, God is slow to anger, God is forgiving. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. If my life was to be messed up, spiritually speaking, I would rather run into the hands of an angry God than into the hands of angry church members. Because in the hands of an angry God, there's mercy, there's forgiveness, there's grace. But in the hands of angry church members, no mercy. They start having a church board in the ambit of their own bedroom, and even they'll determine we are going to do, drop his name. Especially if it's the loud mouthed preacher man like Evangelist Kufa. They'll even celebrate that day. But God, it pains him. It repented God that man, he, that he created man. God did not regret creating man. But what pained him is that man will not hearken. To hearken is to hear what God says and to follow, to do as according to what he says. I've heard many times people saying there are diseases that are hereditary. They are transmitted from, or, or from the parents to the children, to the grandchildren. Maybe, yes. But my, my take is this, that second commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 through 6, says, thou shalt not make any graven image in the likeness of anything in the heavens above, in the earth, or in, in the waters beneath the earth. For them I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This thing, the iniquities of the fathers unto the children, to the third and fourth generation, of those that hate me and disobey me. Those, the, if someone can come to church and sit, sit here and sing and praise God, but meanwhile, they hate God because they don't give glory to God, they don't obey God. Then saying, and showing mercy to the thousands of those that love me and obey me. To love God is to obey God. And to obey God, obedience is better than sacrifice. Whether it makes sense or not, you just have to obey, obey God. And there we find the health message. So some people have said, what does it mean? God visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate him. Does it mean that God is going to punish the children to the third and fourth generations for the sins of the fathers? The answer is a categorical no. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20. The Bible says, I will not hold the son accountable for the sins of the father, neither the father accountable for the sins of the son. Each one will bear the consequences of their own wrong choices. Each one. That's why salvation is non-transferable. That's why there's nobody here who shares the same fingerprint with any other person. Whether it's your child, whether it's your mother, whether your siblings, there's nobody the same fingerprint like you and me in Zambia. There's nobody the same fingerprint like you and me in the entire world believed by demographers to be housing more than 8 billion people. There has never been, and there will never be, anyone sharing the same fingerprint with anybody from the inception of the world to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You are unique. I'm unique, and therefore, even my final destiny is dependent upon the choices that I make today. That one nobody can make for you. So what does it mean, this in the iniquities? Simply put, when you look at the health message, it is like this, the way I understand it. The best way to lead people, whether in the church, whether in the home as parents, whether at a place of work, even the people you interact with, there are only three best ways because we affect other human beings 75% by the things we do either negatively or positively. So the three best ways to interact, the three best ways to live life, the three best ways to lead people, number one, by example. Number two, by example. Number three, by example. Parents, if you tell your children don't drink beer, but you have got bottles of wine in your bedroom, just know whether you like it or not, one day they're going to drink beer. That's why even God says in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, I hate divorce. Divorce has got more bearing, more serious consequences on the children than on the parents. That's why we've got a lot of young, angry men and women. Some of them are committing suicide. Every time you open your social media, you see suicide here. They've lost hope. And some of them, it's because their parents divorced and it's chewing them in their brains. So this in the iniquities of the fathers and of the children. Health-wise, it's like this. In my family, the most prominent disease, it's a diabetes. Our late father had diabetes. My mother, she's still alive. She's 86. She had both diabetes and high blood behind and hypertension. But they've reversed because I had to speak to her very seriously. I told her, it's you who's got the key to your life. But you should know that the life in you doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. So it is you. If you want to follow your appetite, well and good. 
Dad, when was diagnosed with diabetes, and we took him to Riverside those days, I was not knowledgeable about these things like I am now. So they said, when he's eating things like Nshima, carbohydrate, make him a small little lump. But you know, Dad was uh, a man who used to call himself Aaron John Kufa Okanga Boma. And they cook Nshima, they bring him a small lump like this, he would roar like a lion. How can I eat a small shima like this? It's me who's waking and bring the money. They treat me like a slave. Say it's my health. So most probably and many times is that the diet the, that we used to subsist on in our parents' home, even when we have established our own homes, we continue the same lifestyle and those diseases will follow us. That's what it means. Visiting the iniquities. That's why God said in uh, Exodus chapter 15, 26, if you hearken to my voice, I will not put on you any of those diseases that I put on the Egyptians. And today, science has discovered that the diseases that used to ravage the Egyptians are the modern day diseases of cancer, hypertension, high blood pressure, hemorrhoids, piles, you can name it Alzheimer's disease. They also are coming from food. The health message is there. We even find there is a, the sanctuary message. What do I mean? Adam and Eve did not die that day when they eat of the forbidden uh, fruit. But did something die that day? Oh, yes. God himself, they sew together fig tree, fig leaves, but with the sweltering heat and the hot sun, I believe they cracked and they remained naked. But God had to come and slaughter an animal. The first animal that died was killed by God. That first animal was standing in the stead of Jesus Christ. So the type of Jesus Christ. And was teaching them that instead of you dying, a substitute has died in your place and he made tunics and covered their nakedness. What they were doing was legalism, trying to work their way to salvation by their own ways. It is only God. We can, our works are like filth rags. That's what the Bible says. So there we can see through the health message because of them disobeying God and eating what God said, don't eat. Then God had now to kill an animal to teach them that salvation only comes through God, through obedience, through the health message. That's why Revelation 13 verse 8, the Bible says, And all the inhabitants of the earth, they shall worship him, the first piece of Revelation 13, whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the earth. That was Jesus Christ was slain. And from there onwards, God instituted a system before even the sanctuary was put, which was put when the children of Israel were moving to the promised land in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, where I said, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst to teach the plan of salvation. But right there in the garden of Eden, through that animal, God said, now when you sin, you must lay your hands on the head of the animal, symbolically transferring your sins to that animal. And then you, the sinner, you must kill that animal. And the most difficult animal to kill, according to those who kill animals, you see, they say it's a lamb. I cannot kill not even a chicken. I don't, I don't even want to be around when they're killing a chicken. I, can, I may be around when they're eating the chicken, but not when they're killing it. Because then God would tell you to get the lamb and then lay your hands on that lamb and turn it around and then it twists its head upwards so that the jugular vein is exposed and with a sharp knife you cut it as the blood is shooting up you turn it around and then you embrace it tightly and you are looking into the eyes of that lamp and you see the life dimming and going out of it and the blood is hitting you on the chin beneath there's a dish and the water is cold the blood is collating there until it breathes its last they say it's the most difficult animal to kill. When you have cut its throat, even before you cut the throat, it begins to cry. It will not open its mouth, but you see tears rolling down its cheeks. You have to be very strong. Why did God do that? To teach that sin must not be trifled with. It may be very easy to kill a goat, because a goat is cantankerously to kick and, is, and to make a lot of noise. So to shut it up, you may kill it, and you may feel justified to kill it. But that's what God did. He, he was teaching through the health message that Jesus Christ was going to come and die for mankind. He even pronounced those words as he was speaking to the servant. I'm going to put an enmity between you, the snake, and the woman. And between the seed of the woman, that's Jesus Christ, and your seed. Well, you shall bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is going to bruise your head. He's going to close you down. He's going to finish you. And when Adam and Eve heard that, because when they fell into sin, they became despondent. They had nothing to hope for. They thought it was finished. But when they heard the words of Jesus, of God, that was the gospel, the everlasting gospel. Then hope took place. 
They were looking forward to the coming Messiah. They thought the Messiah was going to come during their generation. That's why when they had their first son by the name of Cain, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son, and they called his name Cain, meaning I've gotten a man from the Lord. They thought that Cain was the promised Messiah. Literally they know that brought the first murderer into the world. But whether one be a murderer, the grace of God is very abundant. There's no sin that anyone can commit that God cannot forgive. So the health message is the wage. I've said it to Chelsea Church. Because sometimes even when you are making a budget, the budget for the health department is very little. We are doing a market evangelism at Chelsea Market. We've done it twice this year and last year. Even at the peak of coronavirus, I said to the pastor, get me a PA system. We're going to the market. And we go to the market there, we sing, and we, we have got people checking blood pressure and whatever, and it was packed because today if you go to the clinic for them to check your, your, your sugar levels, those stubs, they're very expensive. So if you have the clinic, they'll charge you. But at the market, we're doing free of charge. And then we have got health experts, those that are found with the hypertension, we sit them down and we start counseling and we are preaching. And even now, if I pass through my Chelsea market, the minute those women see me, you will hear a, a ruckus you have never heard before. Hallelujah! He's here! That people come home from all denominations because of health issues. That I've been invited to preach at guest, um, uh, guest days. I did a guest day at Minu the church. They had about 20-something uh, guests. Then afternoon we had a Bible study. Many of them since then have become Adventists. They come home because of the health issues. They hear things they've never heard. They try, just tell them, go and eat cabbage, do this, take kind of paper, and they get okay. They say, there's a the truth in that. That is the truth. And there is a the power. They, that's how we give the glory to God. Then go, people would start now saying, well, it is not the herbs. No, people ask me, hey, Brother Kufa, we hear you've got herbs for hypertension and diabetes. I tell you, I don't have herbs. When you come, I want you to come home. If you are married, if you are a lady, come with your husband. Or come with one of your children who are old enough. But why it's me with the sick? I said for one reason. I want them to be witnesses. The Bible says in the testimony of two or three witnesses, there's credibility. What I'm going to say to you, I want to say it in your presence, in their presence, so that when you go home and start doing things wrong, they will tell you this is not what he said. They will help you, but the one who has got the key is you. And there is, but why are we coming home? Why don't you tell us what to take? I said, no. Unlike what they do at the hospitals, they just look at the effect. But me, I'll look at the cause. Because prevention is better than a cure. So we go to the beginning where you got your hypertension from, where you got your diabetes from. We go to the root cause. And the root cause is eating food which is not food. Food is only that which the creator said you can put in. Anything which God said don't put in. And in its original form, once you are going to, to refine it, it becomes dangerous. It damages the body. It does. Oh yes, it does. Just changing the diet and the lifestyle to start exercising water, sunlight, and, and also eating the right amount. You heard what the, the preacher man said here. The, the, the stomach of a human being is like these two palms put together. Especially our sisters, when they go for kitchen parties, they love it there because there are no men there. And if it is a lavish kitchen party, there are all tables laid with the food. It's a pie worker. They go with a plate and they would dish and put. You find someone is carrying a plate like this. Their face is obscured. You can't see it because of the heap of food. And you are wondering, where are they taking that food? All that food will be converted into carbohydrate. It's carbohydrate is going to be converted into sugar, and from sugar it's converted into fat. Then you have got a protruding stomach and say, That's why they say in Ibemba. That's not good eating. Slim, be slim and be fit. There must be biceps and triceps and a six pack. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm 25 years young. I can preach from January 1 to the 1st of December without losing my voice and going higher and higher and higher and higher. That's what God brought us into this world for because God is the one who has got the solution to disease through natural remedies. God can never go wrong. God is never wrong. 
God knows more than all the doctors that have, that have ever existed on this planet Earth from the beginning up to now. Just one cell in the human body, even the doctors cannot dissect, they cannot explain to you, it is as complicated as the entire universe. Scientists now, they are agreeing that the universe seems to be expanding. It's expanding. You can't. That's God. We'll never reach a point where we can understand God and dissect him to say it's like this. If we ever reach that point, then God would cease to be God. Then we'll be equal to God. So God is all-knowing. God is gracious and he must be given glory. He has brought us this far and he'll take us as far as he wants us to go. For this generation, according to Psalms chapter 90 verse 10, we have been given a minimum number of years to attain at least 70 years if you're not involved in a, an accident. 70 to 80 years and beyond, it's a bonus, but full of pain, but still surviving. The world have discovered that human beings contribute to the welfare, to the well-being of society from 60 years and above. Because then we are not thinking of self, no, I want to buy a Mercedes Benz, when I go in the park at the shopping mall, they must see me, how I look, how I drive. No, we are just thinking of what should I do? What legacy must I leave behind? What must I do for posterity? That's why even the presidents, when they retire, they find something to do. They've got to start this project or that project to be remembered by. So we must still be very productive. Sixty, don't throw us away. Old, but not cold. That is how we give glory to God. That's how we give glory to God. To do according to what he tells us to do. That's giving glory to God. Those that hate God don't obey him. And he told the children of Israel, if you are going to hearken to my voice, I will not put on you any of these diseases. But there they were, they were eating special food, plant-based food. How do I say so? Because when they tested, they couldn't identify that food. They said it tasted like coriander. Coriander, it's a herb. And then they started asking a question, what is it? What is it? What is it means manna. Manna, that manna means what is it? But they got fed up with manna. We are eating vegetables every day. We are thinking of the steamy pots of flesh in Egypt. God got fed up with their whining and pining and told Moses to pray. And then the quails came and they ate and they died in their thousands. Beloved, the cause of disease is 75% of the diseases we suffer from, they come through what we ingest and what we do the body. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31 says, whether you drink or eat or whatever you do, some of the diseases, they come through misuse of the body. Some of the diseases, they come through just being living a sedentary life, just seated there, you have eaten a healthy meal and you're just seated, just know whether you like it or not, by, not by choice, diabetes and hypertension will come in. You must move this body. God said, from the sweat of your face, you shall, from the sweat of your face, you shall eat food. Meaning you must toil. This modern day Christianity, where preachers will stand in front of the congregation and tell them, just plant the seed, then you are going to reap a Mercedes Benz. There are no factories in heaven where they manufacture Mercedes Benz. Even the text that the young preacher used here, said John verse 2, that I wish you to prosper and be with good health. When you talk to people about prosperity, they're just thinking of, of the common things, of the physical things. That's the smaller picture. The bigger picture is the eternal life. And the eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. We need people. The church this time should have been doing exploits. Going with the health message. Nobody can deny it. You can go to any home, even a Muslim. And you know, I've been to Muslim homes. I've been there. Elder Mwinga, I've been to Muslims around there. And, uh, I'm speaking to them. Who are you? I said, I'm a preacher, man. I'm Kufa. How old are you, old man? He tells me I'm 69. I said, do you know that you're a candidate for a large prostate gland? What? I said, do you know you've got the medicine here at home? And I show him. That stuff there with. So I yes. Can you bring some powder? I go and make powder and bring for him. Oh, my son is also having this. I give you. Come. And they, they even keep on ringing me. That was his health. And through that, then they say, wow, Adventists, we didn't know that you have got this message. You are not talking about miracles. We are talking about the things because good, healthy, real healthy comes from God, who is the creator of mankind. And God does not suffer from prejudice. With God, there's no Muslim, there's no Christian. With God, there's no Bemba, there's no Tonga. With God, there's no black, there's no white. With God, when we stand at the cross, we are all on ground zero. Listen to me, my brother, my sister. If it had happened that you were the only sinner in the entire world, Jesus would still have died for you. You are precious. Listen, as I'm closing, what the Bible says, 
in First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Because I was rattling those verses. Some of you didn't have an opportunity to write those verses. But at least this one you can write. It begins with an exclamation. What? Shocked. What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Who you have of God and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Give the glory to God in everything that you do. Even the way you eat the food. I was saying the stomach of human beings like these two palms put together. But then you are going to have a hip. The Bible says in the Proverbs 23 verse 1, you will sit down at the table to eat with the king. Don't be enticed by his delicacies. Apply a knife to your throat. You heard the young man here. I was hearing him. Don't eat in between meals. You have eaten breakfast. Between breakfast and lunch, nothing. The only thing you can take is water. Here to Tobomu, to there. You, I, they can, I can go anywhere. Whether it's a state house, they can bring their delicacies. I'll not even look at them. Oh, and that's why, even many times, all the times that I've come here, even today, it's not that because I'm demeaning the people here. In my car, I've come with my, my, my container, with my food. Food that I prepared myself, I know my food. If I'm going to a wedding, for a wedding, whether I'm the guest of honor, if we leave home after 13 hours, 13 hours, I eat my lunch. My meal at Shima. Then we go to that wedding. They can have all the goodies. I will not touch, I will not look, I will not drink anything. I only drink water. I was diagnosed with diabetes in 2011. Not because I was sick. I was doing a crusade and you know I'm a stickler for time. That's how our dad brought us up. This morning I was here by 6.45. So I go to Olympia and the crusade, I'm supposed to start preaching at 18 hours. I was there by 16 hours and I found they were checking sugar. I said, check me also. They said, no, this one is the last. I said, please. So they pricked me and put on the stub. Suddenly, the nurse and the doctor were agitated. Huh? How are you feeling? I said, cool down, cool down. Well, why are you so excited? They said, you are very sick. I said, me? They said, yes. Actually, I'm supposed to be in the intensive care. I said, no, I think you're talking of someone. They said, no, it's you. <laughs> I said, how can I be sick? I've been here two weeks and I've been preaching every evening. And I've had the three of my interpreters sit down. They've lost their voices. Me, we're supposed to be sick. We're supposed to be in intensive care. I haven't lost my voice. They said, no, you're very sick. I said, what is it? They said, your sugar is too high. I said, how high? They said, it's 24. I said, what is normal? They said, 5.8. And I still preached. Following day, he brought me an envelope full of metformin. You take one tablet at lunch hour. I only drank for four days. Fifth day, I bought paraffin and matches and set them fire. I'm going, no, I'm going to be a slave to make catch it and burnt it. Since then, I used to, you, you remember, I used to come here. I used to be big. I used to put on specs all the time. Now, I, I don't need those specs. I can see as far as I want to see. I can preach without reading from the Bible. The Bible is here. I can do everything. I can run. Can you run with me? <laughs> Wherever I go to preach, one uh, young man rang me yesterday. Where are you tomorrow? I said, I'm at Central Church. Oh, too bad. I thought it was one of these churches I was going to volunteer that I come and interpret for you. He was whizzing and passing. He almost collapsed when I was doing a crusade at City Church. And they wanted to change interpreters. I'm going like a bullet. And the young man is 29. He's, he's, he's sluggish. The other one, they had to come and relieve him. I said, what's going on with you? I can hold my breath for more than two, two minutes. And they know people over 60 years, you can, should hold your breath. The maximum you can go maybe is 15 seconds. Me, two minutes, I'll hold it. Well, I'll demonstrate to you this afternoon when you come here and even tomorrow. Yeah, because I, it's when I look in the mirror and I see my grandchildren, I know I'm old. But inside, there's a young man inside me. Hallelujah! Yeah. Give the glory to God. That way we give the glory to God. You are given an assignment. You do it to your fullest, to the fullest of your ability. Not you are given to preach. You are the one preaching. You stand here. The first thing that comes out of your mouth, I excuse No, children of God, you must excuse me. During the week, I had pneumonia or I had a cold, a cold I had a flu, I was coughing. We are not interested in the flu. Sit down, let someone else preach. I've never gone halfway to a seminar. Sometimes I can do a tandem of crusades, three crusades for three weeks. I, I refuse when they invite me to do a crusade for two weeks. I say, no, me, it's three weeks. Where are you going? We should do three weeks or four weeks. I can run three crusades in a line. No resting every day. 
I have never missed one sermon for the past 30 years. It's not because of me. It is because we give glory to God by doing what God says. And then we have got good health and we are able to do our part. He said to those disciples, let her alone. She has done that which she can. And our prayer should be, God, uh, uh, grant me the serenity to accept things that I cannot do. And the courage to do that which I can. And the wisdom to tell the difference. God will not do for us that which he has assigned us to do. But the things that are beyond us, God will do for us. That's how we give glory to God. Realizing that I don't belong to myself. When the time comes to sleep in the quarters of the earth, I will have run my race and we pass on the baton and the life continues. That's the way it ought to be. 80 years, you are still vibrant. My mother is 86, she's still walking up and down and, and tilling the land. And we ought to do like that. Give glory to God. Could there be someone who says, Oh Lord, I know that many times we've been enticed by the tastier things of food, which is not food. Food is only that which God said you should eat. And in its natural form, not processed, once it's touched by the human hand, it loses value and it affects the body. Many of us suffer from uh, constipation, hemorrhoids and powers because of eating processed food. If that is your prayer, my brother, as I make it my prayer, that I continue to give glory to God. That I hold on. There's no glory in me. Glory comes from Jesus Christ. Comes from obeying him. Coming from doing his bidding. If that is your prayer, I invite you to stand with me. And God bless you as you stand. Where is our chorister? Shall we sing our song? To God be the glory. Three forty one to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory in great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God. Next offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done, great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and greater rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but pure and higher and greater will be our wonder transport when Jesus we sing. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he hath done. Hallelujah. Before I pray, there could be one who says I've been coming to church as a routine. But I've heard 
that if I was the only sinner, if I were the only sinner, Jesus would still have died for me. That I'm of great value. That I was bought at a price, not with the perishables like gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus took my place on the cross. That me, a sinner who was destined for hell, may inherit the heavenly kingdom. That me, a sinner who was destined for, uh, for death, may have eternal life. So I don't want to postpone salvation to another unknown date in the future because the future is a mystery. Tomorrow is a mystery. Yesterday is history. What belongs to me is today. I don't want to go back home the same way I came this morning. I want to go assured of eternal life. I want to go assured of all my sins forgiven. I want to go assured of my name written in the book of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Could there be one with such a prayer? Could there be one, one with such a desire? Could there be one with such a quest? And could there it be that that one is you, my brother, or you, my sister? You want to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. At the next available opportunity, you want to be baptized. If it is you, I invite you to raise your hand before I pray. Do I see a hand? Do I see a hand? Yes, those that raise their hands, just walk to the front so that we also pray for you as we pray for the congregation. Come, my brother. Come, my sister. Come quickly so that we, we pray. We don't delay the program. God bless you. God bless you. There's rejoicing in heaven over one repentant sinner than over 99 righteous ones. God bless you. Stand there. God bless you. Shall we pray? We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your love that holds on to us so tenaciously that you have refused to give up on any one of us, no matter who we are, because you do not suffer from prejudice. Only, God, if we could give glory to you by hearkening to your voice, by doing that which you tell us to do, would be saved from the many miseries that we go through. The entire world is groaning under the burden of sickness because we have trusted more in ourselves, because we have trusted more in scientists and technology than trusting in you. You are never wrong, you are always right. We thank you, Lord, that even at the preaching of the gospel, yes, our son, our brother, has come to the front, not intimidated by the many eyes that were beholding him as he came to front, because he has focused his eyes on you, Lord Jesus. He has set his face like a flint, never to be detracted. Receive him as he is. Forgive him of all his past sins. May his name be chronicled in the book of life. May you make him to walk in the palm of, his, of your hand the rest of his, his days on earth. May you assign guardian angels to put a special hedge of protection round about to him. That Lord God, he will not be snatched from your hand by the enemy of souls until when you come. And as you come, where, as you remember us in your kingdom, remember him also. May you bless this church. May you now lift up your countenance upon us and be gracious unto us. May you make the light of your face to shine upon us and give us peace. Peace beyond the human comprehension. Peace in our hearts. Peace in our families. Peace in our studies. Peace in whatever we do. So that whatever we do, we may do it to your own and glory. If any one of us happens to stumble and fall, may you lift us up and make us to walk in the palm of your hand the remaining days of, of our lives. May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit forever abide with all of us because we have asked and prayed in Jesus' name, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.
Hey.